Good morning, good afternoon, based on the part of the world you're watching this webcast from. My name is Sajid, and I'm part of marketing organization here at Cscaler. A very warm welcome to everyone for participating in today's webcast, Cloud Security is Now a Boardroom Agenda. Yes, that's right. According to a recent survey, cybersecurity is now a topic of discussion at the majority of board meetings. We've got two great speakers for today's webcast. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mark Stafford. Mark is a senior cyber consultant from BD Security and has been with BD for 12 years now. Mark has been a key contributor to the development of BT Security Consultative Lead Approach to Cybersecurity. He also brings a pragmatic approach which understands that people and process are as important as technology in fighting cyber threats. Our second guest speaker for today's webcast is Kevin Peterson. Kevin is a proven cloud security expert with 12 plus years of diverse security experience in large organizations. He primarily works with the largest cloud security deployments to ensure that the desired outcomes are achieved. In his current role, Kevin is the Director of Security and Network Transformation at Zscaler. But with that, let me hand it over to Mark. Mark, over to you. Thank you. Um, hopefully um, people can, can hear me. So um, um, what I'm going to do is take you through a, a brief um, presentation uh, around uh, the, the sort of a high level approach to um, how you should work and and deal with um, your board in your, in your organization don 't have all the answers today. this is only going to be a short presentation but but hopefully you 'll see what um, is on the agenda of boards, how they 're thinking, and how you as individuals, wherever you are in your organizations uh, can uh, approach them okay let 's just advance the slide. So I guess this is one of the key things, um, you know, it's, it's a key, key quote for me and I always keep coming back to it. Uh, it's very easy to ruin reputations today and, you know, in a commercial world, a reputation is actually quite a lot. If you realize that nowadays, you know, everybody's on social media, everybody can communicate far more rapidly, you can kill an organization overnight by doing the wrong things. Giving you a couple of examples, in the retail world, there was a, a jewelry, uh, retail jewelry organization in Europe. Uh, the uh, CEO stood up at a, what he thought was a private conference uh, and stated, uh, and I paraphrase this, he stated, we make things very cheap and we sell them for an expensive price to the stupid. Uh, his business went out of business overnight, quite literally, because of that statement. Um, we're, and we've got other cases, and I'll come to them, where that reputation really matters. And actually, when you think about the assets that organizations hold, they often hold information that can also ruin other people's reputation. So you know, it's, it's, I'll come back to that. It's really a, a key piece of, uh, of what I'm, I'm actually about to talk about. Okay, next slide. So um, let's start where we usually do. Let's start with what some of the, the, the big consultancies think about. Now, I'm not going to read all these slides out. Hopefully, if you want to read some of this information which I've digested for you, you can, you, you can look at the replay later. But let's pick up on one of those things on this first slide, which is intellectual property. It's amazing how many organizations just don't realize how much that is worth. And that's why um, gradually, uh, as organizations do trade on that intellectual property, do trade on the value of what uh, they would call on a balance sheet an intangible asset, how that is moving up. And intellectual property often is data. It's often a piece of data or a piece of information, a piece of research, um, something that, that's being created by that organization. And it hasn't necessarily been through all the, uh, what you would call standard or secure processes within an organization. I'll give you an example. Uh, I worked with a company who had a pretty unique product. Um, they were manufacturing it down in Southeast Asia. They were a one billion uh, pound company uh, in terms of their balance sheet. 400 million of that was IPR. So if they lost their IPR, they was as a business, you know, they borrowed against that that 400 million. They were being able to trade against that 400 million on their balance sheet. They were done. They were dead. That company had no information marking at all within the, the organization. They didn't know when they produced the document how important it was. So there was a complete re-education. Now this was two or three years ago, and that 
particular organization has had to move rapidly up the, the information change and the security chain to understand exactly what matters to them most and what they are worth as, a, as an organization. And you get lots of organizations now where IPR is becoming the differentiator and how businesses actually trade. Okay. <clears throat> so the next slide, again, a couple of quotes there that you can read at your leisure. I've picked up on one there, which is mergers and acquisitions. Um, there's a, 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 hist, a historic case. You can find it on the internet. I'm, not, I'm obviously not mentioning company names here for, for reasons of privacy. Um, but it's a major UK bank. Um, they were trying to divest their retail arm. Um, to another bank. Uh, they went through all the usual financial things that, that happen around these mergers and acquisitions and positioning, and they went to various commissions to make sure that this could happen. But ultimately, that divestment failed because there was a risk in the IT estate. Because they weren't running their security properly and because the security failed a number of audit points when, when it was audited, that divestment didn't happen. Now, that affected two large retail banks in the UK. One couldn't divest and execute its business case, and another one couldn't take on that merger or acquisition and execute on its business case as well. So you can imagine how much that put back and how much effort had gone into that, those two organizations, and they hadn't considered the cybersecurity, the information security aspect. So again, that's why these things have been creeping up on the, on the board's agendas. They're serious business affecting large money deals and, and, and large com commerce uh, activities that are being affected by cyber, as well as reputation. Um, so here's, a, a, again, a piece of research uh, going across the pond to the New York Stock Exchange. You know, how often is cybersecurity being di discussed in, in the boardroom? Uh, and you can see the particular statistics there. Now, one of the key points I want to pick up on this is, you know, it's really important that if you're going to get something uh, at a board meeting or for discussion at a board meeting, that you're talking in terms of those high-level uh, strategic descriptions. You know, it's no good going into or presenting something to a board of directors and starting talking about technology. I think there's another survey, I haven't actually got it in this slide here, which says that actually one of the skills that, that needs to be greater in the board level is IT. And as you can imagine, it takes a while for a CEO to get to the top of large organizations. So that's going to be a generational thing, and it's still happening. So the business is interested in talking about, you know, balance sheet. It's inter Will something affect my balance sheet? Is this going to create a supply problem? Is this something that is actually going to re affect our, our reputation? Is it going to affect my liquidity or cash flow? So don't talk about a website. Don't talk about a network. Start talking about what that actually means to the business and, uh, and, and how, it will, how the business will be impacted in those kinds of languages, and you will get cyber uh, on the actual uh, board's agenda. Um, and let's go back to the reverse of that. Why is it not actually being prioritized by senior management? And again, there you can see this is from CEO Insights. It's a magazine that uh, interviews and records the uh, CEO's uh, activities. Um, key thing here is about assets. We talked about, I talked about balance sheets. You know, it's important to talk about those assets and discuss those assets. If you look at a balance sheet, go and read your own company report, you'll see that it's a key element of those company reports. Without assets, an organization can't borrow money. It can't get that liquidity. It doesn't have that cash flow, you know, and, uh, and it, it doesn't have something necessarily that it can trade on. Um, and, and a key thing then also is to talk around, you know, what, tell stories about those assets. And don't just think about assets as, uh, you know, a very tiny individual thing. Think about the big picture in terms of assets. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll kind of illustrate this. 
the business level is, is interested in services. They're interested in launching new products, new services. They're interested in how they deliver those products through services. And when we talk about service here, we're genuinely talking about business services, not IT type services. That's what the board understands. That's what they're going to talk about. That's what they want to know how to protect. When they talk about risk statements and threats, they're interested in the risks and the threats to those services, not to you know individual uh, assets that happen to have an IP address. So if you're talking down at those IP address asset or ICT asset levels, maybe you're talking about a website, well, what website, what services that impact? Does it impact the ability for me to sell a product, to buy a product, or is it just an informational website? That's what they really want to know, so that if there is going to be, for example, some reputational damage, and it is just about reputational damage, they can decide on a risk basis whether they want to take that hit or whether they need to actually do something about that particular uh, website. So there's an example again. And if you look at that diagram, for example, a, a, a typical one, it might be, you know, um, they'll look at buildings, they'll look at people, but they'll also look at the information before they look at the, a particular individual asset. So it's key, it's key to always bear this in mind when you're approaching a board with um, a particular issue around uh, something that could be impacted by a cyber attack or a, or a hack or something. Um, I, I, I'm going to mention there might be some size on the call around target, but I'm not going to tell the target story here. I want to show where there has been a change in emphasis and why it is on, on the board's agenda. So if you look, were to look at the targets 2013 annual report, you'll notice that there was only one line around cyber or IT security. Now this is not unusual, um, look two or three years back, in fact look in some, uh, some uh, company reports right now, you may get one line if you're lucky around cyber. Those companies where that are now uh, tuned in and understand that you know, their business relies on reputation and data and, and the <coughs> keeping that data secure, they've started to increase the amount of risk that they report back to the shareholders. And of course, we're all shareholders and we understand and we challenge companies back about those particular issues. <coughs> so you can see in 2014, we went from one entry to three entries, and those three entries were high up in that risk register. I think in the terms of target, and they were around about four, well, the first one that appeared fourth in the, in the risk register. Now that's quite high, that's showing how cyber is moving up um, at the, the, the food chain, if you like, in terms of risk and in terms of organizations being, being uh, wanting to be in control of those risks and, and mitigate against them. And just one more slide on this, just to put it into perspective, you know, the CEO and the CIO of, those, of, of Target have gone, you know, and that makes it a board level agenda. People and other organizations or the CEOs, CIOs will be looking at this. It's not just a CISO that's going to carry the can anymore um, because in effect everything that's happened in Target and you can see some of the numbers and figures and lawsuits that are going there, this hasn't finished. This is not just a one shop reputational damage. This is actually business impacting and it's impacting the balance sheet. And in fact, in the 2014 balance sheet, they've actually kept a lot of the cyber stuff off the balance sheet. So it's still going to appear in 2015 and probably 2016 and therefore impact their profits and impact their share price. So we're talking about major share price things and that's why it's, not, it's now on organizations' agendas. And of course, other organizations look at that. I once sat um, in, a, in a, a bank um, and I was asking them how they measured, uh, you know, the impact of cyber. Uh, and one uh, CIO jokingly said, we look across the road, if it happens to our rivals, we look at their share price and then we decide whether it's a risk to us or not. That's the amateur days. That's not happening anymore. You know, this is getting a lot more serious uh, than that. Um, so is there, is there something that can kind of sum up the, the kind of approach that, that I've just talked about in terms of approaching sea level? Well, your C-level want to be situationally aware. They want to know the what, the where, the how of their business. They want to know the strategy. So they have a set of organizational objectives that they want to achieve. Uh, that, 
those organizational objectives should be known by every part of the organization, including IT security. They understand the risks that they should be taking or they should be aware of those risks that they're taking. Business is about taking risks. It's about understanding those risks, understanding the cost to mitigate those risks, and then either taking the risk, signing it off, or doing something about it. But in order to do that, you need to know your threats. You need to know your actors. You need to know the people who are going to cause you or the things that are going to cause you harm. And that's what the sea level is interested in, that really high level strategy, you know, that affects business plans, where the risk models are, and they need to look at threat assessments. Because ultimately, they're going to direct the CISO to say, this is what I, I want you to sort security out. And he's going to be interested in policy. He's going to be interested in plans, coverage, and, and capabilities. And what's happening at the top should be driving policy. It shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction. Policy should never be created based on the fact that something happened. It should be based on whether the risk is going to be managed or not. And what the CISO then does is support the SARC or the security operations through making sure that there's an operating model that fulfills those organizational objectives. So we can do all the good stuff that we're meant to do in a SARC, you know, react, respond, recover. But also the key one there is that we can start to be proactive and start to do some threat landscaping. And ultimately, what happens in the SOC, the old lessons learned, informs the business again. Look, we've seen a new threat, we've seen a new actor, we've seen some scenario that could happen to us, and we've put that into a story that the, the, the business understands. It's not some technical vulnerability, it's a story about how it would impact the business and what bits of the business would impact, and you go back around the cycle again. And finally, I thought, you know, given we're, we're with, um, uh, with our friends at Zscaler from BT, I'd just um, give you a, an oversight of some of the, the issues and the problems that the CIs have that all of us on the, the, the call can have around, for example, cloud. So, you know, there are benefits of cloud. As we all know, there are risks of cloud. And, and, and the key for that is to understand that, you know, most CIOs actually believe, you know, those benefits outweigh the risks, but it's for up to us to help them to tell that story back to the board. Uh, and an example, and this is taken again from CIO Insights, it's not a technical publication. You know, one of the keys with any part of uh, securing an organization or preparing for anything uh, on a technical level <coughs> is preparation. You know, you've got to be prepared to do something, and that means having done all the plans, as we said, looked at the capabilities, made sure you've got the policy. And one of the other things, uh, and a little plug from, for, for what we do is, you know, make sure that you've got appropriately skilled and experienced contractors to do that. Make sure you've got the appropriately skilled people within the business who can help you do that. And with that, I'll pass over to Kevin. Great, thanks, Mark. That was that was really really great. Uh, so let me go ahead and advance the slides. Almost there we go. All right. So thanks, Mark. Um, you know, as I was asked to present this particular topic, I was sitting there going, "Great." Uh, certainly, a topic I'm passionate about. One that. Um, you know, I think I could add some stuff too, but as soon as I got into it, I realized, wow, what a huge challenge it is. It, not only is it a topic that's quite frankly on fire, um, but, it, you know, creating something of value also becomes a little, little bit of a challenge. There's just so much content out there. And I look at the, uh, you know, the sheer number of attendees we have on this, and I'm sure many more that will, will come and look at this type of stuff on demand. And I just realized that, you know, these are the, those that are attending this are really leading, um, you know, the thought leaders that will bring around the business change that everybody's looking for, uh, you know, hopefully to get a lot of this stuff out of the news media. So I decided, you know, instead of just Googling a bunch of stuff, let's look at what security professionals are talking about. So go to an actual forum uh, for a bunch of professionals. In this case, we looked at LinkedIn, of course. And it was interesting here because what I found is there were just searching for cybersecurity in boardroom, 10,547 results. But when you actually drill into any of these stories, it becomes a little bit more interesting because you see the sheer number of contents. Now, many of us have been poking around LinkedIn for many years, and it's not at all uncommon to see comment threads going to the tens or dozens or 
whatever. Uh, but when you start getting 146 comments, and you, then you start drilling in, you say, well, I disagree, and I agree, and, you know, just a lot of the, uh, the rich personalities in there are kind of duking it out. You realize, hey, this is, this is really challenging, and this really needs to be explored a little bit more. And then they, it asks, and here we ask the question, do boards actually care about cybersecurity? It's a fair question. Well, I, I think there are some things that will go to uh, driving that agenda quite a bit. And one is, you can see here, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, decided that in an appeals court decision that they have the right to uh, regulate some of the uh, cybersecurity efforts that a company has. And you can see this one actually made me laugh, just the, you know, I was chuckling when I read it, because it's not that often you get something so simple, basically a soundbite from a circuit court appeals judge that's basically making the case against you, right? If you're the, uh, the customer in this case, because here you have 619,000 uh, users affected, and that makes a great point, right? If you were to leave 619,000 banana peels on the floor, it doesn't mean that you're not liable for any damage that could come to it. Uh, and then anybody who might say, well, yeah, that's the Federal Trade Commission, only really needs to look at HIPAA you know, on the healthcare side here out of the United States and others around the, around the globe. Uh, governments also regulating and legislating around the security controls and, and effectiveness that you have to display. And if you don't, you're simply going to get fined for that. And, um, you know, those are, those are some real things that everybody faces. Now, uh, Mark had this exact same slide, different pivot. To it. His was rotated to, to the side. But I wanted to share it again uh, because I think it really just has so much impact. And the one that I, at least me, and I'm not typically a glass half full type of guy, but as I look at this, I see, wow, 10% only look, still today, right, in, in this latest survey, only 10% go and deal with anything after an internal industry incident. That's a, that's a terrible number as far as I'm concerned. It, what it means is that one out of 10, every 10 companies out, out there that should be accountable to this stuff are really only purely reactive. So what might happen at some point if, you know, there's a, there is some sort of breach and I, as an investor or some sort of stakeholder, but, you know, there's a, um, there's a lawsuit or what have you, all of a sudden my meeting notes, my boardroom presentations and everything else might be up for discovery, right? They might be a part of the subpoena process. And uh, honestly, it might be the rope that, that hangs me and or the organization. So very real challenges with that. So bringing all this stuff together and really trying to get, um, some level of understanding. What I came to realize is, well, you know, I can, as a security professional, I can go through and either presenting to a board myself or, or preparing my executives to go present to a board, I can go through all these things that are out there, all these forums and whatnot, and good information, there's absolutely some great information out there, uh, or I can just kind of anchor against something, something that has been studied at length and, and really gone into. So in this case, we picked Forrester, I did, uh, along with uh, several members of our team, said, look, Forrester has, you know, the, the presenting to the board handbook, if you will, where they've also, I'm sure, gone out and looked at those 10,500 stories on, uh, that have been shared on, on LinkedIn and all the comments and commentaries, but more importantly, talk, actually talk to the executives, talk to the board members, and said, here are the things that you need to be focusing on. So what are those things? Well, uh, in that document, there are really four that, that it boiled down to. What are the new and emerging trends? What is the plan to progress, progress against it? How do we compare against our peers? And what is the gap in consequences? But to boil it down even further, it's basically answering the question, are we safe and how do we compare against our peers? Fair enough question. So what I decided to do, just to have a little bit of fun with this, is actually do a mock scenario. So we're taking a company, a fictitious company called Safe March, and if we look at Safe March and we go into where they're at, you know, just some background detail here. Basically, it's doing a presentation that, based off of my research and talking to the CIO and others uh, at that level, to understand the CEO perhaps. What is the board looking for? What is their level of maturity? Where are we at? And actually just, just run them through, but going and anchoring against those four things that we talked about with Forrester. 
Now, the goal here is, is for anybody watching this, is not to take this and use this as a template for your own presentation. I'm a huge advocate of certainly being authentic in your own presentation style. So your presentation style might vary greatly. Your content, based off of the maturity of the company and your programs, of course, will vary greatly. But can you go through and, and basically use this as a preparation tool? Mark talked about it. He talked about being prepared. And I, I think these mock scenarios go a great way into getting that pr preparation. So I'm going to kind of get out of, um, get into character, basically. I'm going to get into character for, uh, you know, I'm the head of security for this Safe March company. So here I am presenting to the board. So board, welcome. Thank you for the time. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and jump right into it in the interest of time. I'm going to answer for you four questions. Uh, you have some packets that I've, I'm leaving with you. You've got them there. Please don't flip through them at the moment. I'll reference what you need to look at. They're mostly for takeaway purposes anyway. And, you know, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So first question I want to answer for you today is what are the new and emerging trends that we in our business are facing? Well, one, like everybody else out there, is board accountability yourselves. You know, we've seen the FTC ruling, the Federal Trade Commission ruling. We've seen many others. You're certainly familiar with those. They're huge topics of interest. We're tracking that as well. We're also seeing users being a huge target. You yourselves, I'm sure, are seeing this on a regular basis. You're on a regular basis. Maybe you've been a victim to some deceptive applications that you've put on your mobile devices. Maybe you've uh, become a victim of some phishing or spear phishing type of attacks. Or maybe you've, you've had your own notifications where your own personal information is out in the public domain and is perhaps even being exploited um, for whatever purpose, right? That, that Those are huge challenges. And it's really recognizing that, that the new attack perimeter is that of the user. If I'm an attacker, why necessarily go after the fortifications, if you will, of the company when I can just go pick a user that's, quite frankly, out in the open? They're not sitting at their desk anymore. Their computing device is out with them uh, at home, at Starbucks or whatever, and they're kind of naked. They're, they're easily, easily to exploit. So that's the soft target that I'm going to go after as an attacker. So that's a real threat. Uh, we also see user experience is actually driving policy. Many of you will remember years ago when um, we at this company had a policy that you could only have Blackberries, and then when the iPhones and what have you came out, we said, well, we're not going to allow those. Well, how long did that last, right? Um, the user experience dominated. Uh, the culture shift happens. And really, it's the, the strong demand for consumerization of IT that continued to define and, in fact, redefine how we manage our security policies. And it's really a bit of a fool's errand, and we've realized this, to only be in the business of allowing or disallowing the applications that we know about on a day-to-day -day basis. Because there's, for every application we know about, there's so many that we don't. Um, it's just a reality of the world we live in. So that's a huge, uh, a huge tactic or a huge uh, challenge for us to get our arms around, like everybody else for that matter. And then encryption is also going mainstream. The, and we're specifically talking about SSL encryption here. We're seeing the, uh, the latest that was just in the news yesterday. Uh, I think it broke yesterday. I, I saw it in the newspaper this morning. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has released their Let's Encrypt um, solution. And what Let's Encrypt does is it's a um, – sorry, getting some mouse movement there. Uh, what the Let's Encrypt <coughs> uh, solution does is it – brings SSL encryption to the masses, meaning we can expect that while our what we're seeing today is as much as 50% of the Internet-bound traffic is encrypted, so we can't, you know, most can't see into it, we expect that number to certainly surge over coming years. And we just can't accept that as a risk. We have to uh, continue to uh, get our arms around that. And then finally, we have cloud adoption. There are just thousands of apps. I touched on a, little, a few seconds ago, thousands of apps. Um, and how do we understand what, what that risk is on a day-to-day -day basis? So kind of, you know, kind of picking out one particular uh, piece of research that this was in CIO Magazine, it maps beautifully to what we see in our business. Uh, we're seeing that uh, several different things here, and I'll go ahead and run, it, run you through the list here. Disgruntled employees is one of the six biggest risks. We, again, here we're seeing that careless or uninformed employees Yes, absolutely a problem for us. Um, mobile devices, yeah, we've got them. Everybody's got them uh, in our technology forward company that we are. Cloud applications, same thing, uh, unpatched or unpatchable devices. 
uh, is also uh, you know up there on the list. But third-party service providers, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more. Uh, our relationship with you know the, the, all the different technologies out there, and how are we doing our vendor assurance? How are we understanding? Um, you know, not only the, the devices, the, the users, their devices, their applications, but really what's going on behind the scenes are our third-party service providers, the known and the unknowns, actually taking care of our data. So to take this to the next level, let's talk about what our plan is to address some of this. Um, we're going to talk about it in two, two ways here. One is in terms of business, and the other one is in terms of technology. Uh, I'm going to spend most time on the business because uh, I think that's what's more and more important for this conversation. Uh, in terms of business, what we want to do is leverage this opportunity to beat our competitors. What we hope to see is that many of our competitors are actually going to be going into a defensive arms race, that they are going to see, well, here's all these headlines, let's go out there and buy up every security technology we can, and therefore we should be in a better place. We're actually not doing that. We're going the opposite direction where we're saying what gets us the most effective security for lowest cost possible. So also in that packet uh, that we have for you, uh, and this is a document that's in the public domain, we, we went ahead and ordered reprints from Harvard Business Review, so you can read it later. It's a great read. Several great quotes here. I, I could only pull up about four or five just to, to help you understand what's going in our minds, but this is required reading for everybody in our in our business, uh, certainly everybody in IT. And what we're trying to get to is a point where we're understanding that these, the true way to be best for the business is to have, and to get our best competitive advantage, is not to have more and more technology, but to get the most we can out of what we've got, and actually just have less of it. Um, and we understand that infrastructural technologies, the cloud, all these things, just have more value when they're shared than in isolation. We see that with, with all sorts of cloud platforms these days. We see it with the, the sales forces. We see it with Workday. We see it with uh, Office 365. How do, we, how do we get on that as well uh, to make security work in our favor? And the list goes on here. You can see several other great quotes. Um, the last one is kind of a duh quote. I think everybody here certainly gets it, certainly preaching to the choir, but it's, it's a realization that, you know, the corporate IT spending, in order to get it under control and work to our favor, we really do truly have the, the data here to back us on it that um, it, it, you can see it here. It really translates into, into superior financial results. Again, kind of a dumb moment, but that's where things are. Now, purely in terms of technology, uh, we, we want to present kind of a simple view here. First of all is we want to scan everything that's possible to scan. And most things are possible to scan. Uh, certainly all of our internet traffic or outbound internet traffic, uh, we want to be able to scan that for data loss, look inside of SSL encryption, inspect for malware, but not just on the network, but as the users are off the network. We don't want them to be that soft target out there. We want them to have that protection. It, it saves us money. We don't have to clean up security events and incidents. Uh, needlessly, and it makes the employees happier because they don't have to surrender their computing devices for a period of time for investigations and possibly embarrassment on their part. So everybody wins, and, and that's really the, um, you know, the, what's driving us for the most part in this, uh, in this goal. Now, how do we compare against our peers? Well, it, it's a fair question, certainly. How do we compare against our peers? Well, what we want to do here is model success. And with that, there's about 13 million users and just fabulous numbers that, that go up with it. So also in your packet, we have this report, so you may have glanced at this and you'll see this. Uh, what we provide here at Safe March is scheduled reporting. Now these reports are available as monthly CXO level reports, but they're also on the secure boardroom file share, uh, so you can get them at any point. As we update those, we put them out there. We want you to be in touch with our own scorecards in how we're doing. If you have any questions, you've got my contact information. If I can't answer it, I'll put you through to one of our team experts that can get you what you're looking for. But as of today, we've had no publicized breaches, which is great. Uh, there are currently no breaches against, the, or against any of our competitors, which is also good for us uh, right now. It takes some of the heat off. And our security platform status, we have a security platform. That's the same one we talked about before as far as the GE, Procter & Gamble, Humana, et cetera, it's 
that rollout to get parity with those type of uh, that type of uh, sophistication is actually due to be completed in Q2 of 2016. So what are the gap and consequences from the ideal? Well, Atlanta is our primary site. We've designated it as our primary site. And what we're going for here is a, we call it the perfect baseline. It, truly nothing's perfect, but it shouldn't, it doesn't mean that shouldn't be our goal. So in this baseline, we're taking everything that uh, the users do or everything that, that is going on at that site, and we're filtering. Basically, all features of the platform are enabled. And then we're using that as a scorecard uh, to go measure against all of the other sites that we have. And it gives us some benefits such, such as security gamification. Our uh, security teams can say, well, we've lowered the score over here. Let's get this uh, better over there. These scorecards, too, are also in your included packet, also available on the secure uh, board file share so you can see on a regular ongoing basis how we're measuring that security. And of course the consequences of not doing so, uh, fairly simple, the brand damage uh, that, that could come about in, on down the line. Okay, so that's it for the board level presentation. Uh, please take your uh, packets with you, uh, get back with me with any questions, and I look forward to uh, sharing some more depth next time, and we'll go ahead and conclude with that. So that's that presentation. Again, it's, it's a genuine attempt on, on my behalf to, to go through the Forrester um, requirements, leveraging a mock scenario of a mock company, um, and you know, hope, hopefully it hit the spot and resonates with many of you. Now to go back and look at specifically at, at Zscaler now, you know, how does Zscaler help me get that better security at a lower cost? Well. Of course, brand rec or recognition across other analysts out there is huge, and the numbers get even more staggering when we look at it. One is 100 data centers worldwide, 100 plus actually data centers worldwide processing all of this client traffic, 13 billion transactions processed every day, 100 million threats, 100,000 security updates. Uh, can you imagine having to do 100,000 security updates just to your own systems on a daily basis? It would be incredible. Um, and then 100% system uptime over the last year. But then we also see, you know, what it, have these organizations been doing to, to try to stay safe? I look at it in two ways, and it's very simple to, to kind of digest here. One is backhauling traffic through the data center, uh, the, basically the old hub and spoke, uh, to many the existing hub and spoke design. Well, yeah, let's leverage our costs better, let's bring everything back to the data center. But really what has happened is that the data center is no longer that relevant, right? The internet has become the hub uh, for all the hub and spoke, all the way down to the individual users. So it's really understanding that we have to change the way we look at, at these architectures and, and these designs. And then of course we can see that security itself has become just prohibitively expensive. Uh, and I, I love this slide. I actually didn't when I first saw it the very first time. I said, wow, what a busy, noisy slide. But this was shared with us by, you can see a Global 50 company. This was their architecture, their slide. And what they said was, look, where we can actually have security and route users through our, our stack of security appliances, we're counting. You can see all the, all the connections here, 28 connections are being made. What does that do to security experience? Not only that, but then when they go run something like a security preview, they realize it's really not that, not that great and effective even when I'm in the network versus really nothing when I'm outside. And of course, we can see the attacks are broader and deeper. We talked about SSL encryption being a, uh, you know, a huge growth factor. And this is just data after data where we can see, you know, webmail is, you know, if I have Russian webmail on my network, well, what's all that all about? Who, who on the call today can even answer that definitively if you were asked to in a moment's notice? Uh, and of course, the fact that people don't have visibility means that they might be very well be compromised and just don't even know it. So what's needed is, we like to say, don't bring a knife to a gunfight, right? So it's several things here. One is implement a platform strategy, you know, a real true platform strategy, not somebody uses the word because they think it's popular and cool, but really do they have the platform to deal with things. Uh, and then blocking the threats, basically, you know, the, the best Defense is a great offense. Do we have that built into our DNA? Uh, deploy SSL decryption sandboxing. With patient zero quarantine, can we 
can we detect patient zero, right, the first person in the world to experience this uh, particular threat and actually block it, and then establish regular process to identify and re and re-image infected devices. And of course, don't trust anything. A lot of security appliances have, you know, over the last, over the years, have kind of given up on a lot of uh, security things in, the, in terms of performance or to enhance performance. And it's really, um, it's really shown to, to be a bit of a, of a challenge. So talking about the platforms, eScaler is a comprehensive unified internet security and compliance platform, a true platform. And you can see all the stuff that goes into this. SSL inspection at the bottom, policy management, reporting analytics, all this stuff. But then on top of that come the, the individual features, and I'm not going to list them all here, but here are the big ones. Web security, advanced persistent threat protection, that's our zero day protection. Next generation firewall, not, ju not just ports 80 and 443, but absolutely all traffic sending it through. Data loss prevention, cloud application visibility control, and even Wi-Fi, guest Wi-Fi protection. All right, protecting the brand and reputation of the company from those who are roaming inside of your network. So being able to handle this across all locations, all devices, all ports and protocols is, is, is absolutely essential. And that's really the platform. And we can see here, you know, some more data as far as, you know, awareness coupled with inline blocking. We want to block stuff in line. We don't want to compromise when it comes to security and say, well, we know that traffic's coming from a, a Google site. And we, we kind of trust Google Sites, so let's, in, for performance reasons, m maybe we just don't do a full scanning. No, that's where you want to do full scanning is everything all the time to make sure that nothing gets through uh, and not implicitly just trusting that some sites are, are somehow better than others because they too get breached. And then talking about cost avoidance, right? The total cost of ownership for security as a service and this is, this is so true, it is up to 80% lower than on-premise applications. Not only that, it's just much more effective for all the reasons I stated before. And of course, eliminating backhauling of internet-bound traffic makes the, the internal corporate network, the business-to-business -business applications internally, your own internal applications, uh, much less congested, much less contending for, um, for that same traffic, right? That, that same amount of available bandwidth but it also makes, you know, and in turn, it makes the users happier. But if you can get better security uh, at the same time as lower cost and savings, right, that, that's really the, the magic formula that we're all striving to. So to wrap this up, uh, a couple things I recommend doing. One is run the Zisco Security Preview. Yeah, it's, a, it's right on our homepage. You can't miss it. Uh, it's a very accurate test. Uh, it doesn't lie to you. It's not a marketing uh, gimmick, anything like that. It's a very true, tried and tested uh, security test that will go allow you, and I encourage you to run it both on your network and off, because of what it will allow you to do is test how good your security really is. So it will go through your entire stack of security appliances, your existing proxies, whatever you may have, and it's, it's going to tell you exactly how it's doing it. Hey, look, we tried to pull down an iCAR test virus, and we, we did this over SSL, and, and it's looking at it from both a security and a compliance mindset and, and spelling it out in those terms so that you can understand that, yes, maybe the things that we've taken as status quo in the past or maybe that we've uh, not gotten our arms around for whatever reasons, I want to, uh, I want to do better with that. So it's, it's a great opportunity, nothing else. Uh, I, I know a lot of our larger customers actually run it on a very regular basis. They actually use it, and I talked about it when I did that mock scenario, hand it to the board. Right, hand it to the boardroom, hand it to the CIO on a regular basis and say, hey, here's how we're scoring in this very objective test that's out there. And what's not there is implicitly what we have accepted as our risk. And let them know they're, they're ultimately accountable for it. So uh, by all means, be, be honest. And of course, take a test drive, you know, if that's the very next step for you, if you're ready for it, uh, go ahead and take that test drive and then sit down and review the secure, those results with our security consultants at Zscale, of which we have uh, just a great supply. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and close this out, and uh, I'll ask, you know, the Sajig, if you want to jump back on here. Yep, thank you, Kevin. That was a great presentation, and specifically, you know, your part on presenting to the board, that was really good. And Mark, thanks for your insights on this topic. 
Great. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Mark. With that, I would now like to conclude this webcast. Thanks to both of you for a compelling presentation highlighting the critical insights on this topic. I would also like to thank your wonderful audience for taking out time uh, from their busy schedule and spend the last hour with us. I hope you enjoyed the webcast and the topic. You all have a great day or the evening, and we hope to see you uh, in our future presentations. Bye for now. Thank you.